Okay, so we had finished uh, till the middle age. Okay, so see, as I told that uh, even in Organon it is mentioned that the 17th century, there is an in-between break, so maybe the continuity is lost a little. As we finished the primitive age, we finished the middle age, and now we come to the centuries, that is the 17th century. In Organon also, Dr. Hanneman has written in the introductory part that the 17th century was the century of geniuses. There were very well-known many names in this century. And this was the century where the scientific spirit had started from Europe and it was spreading everywhere in the world. So this was the century where the real reasoning which I explained previously, this was the century where the reasoning started. People started asking questions. They started finding out the rational answers. As I told you previously, the answers which satisfied the intelligence of one and all and which were based upon scientific investigation. So this was the beginning of science. This was the beginning of medicine. I already mentioned Lord Francis Bacon, who is the father of objective and realistic philosophy. Previously, while explaining inductive logic, I described the contribution of Lord Bacon. I told you that he was neither a scientist nor a doctor. He was just a philosopher. But in his book, Nova Morganum, he described the method of inductive logic. The four steps which I mentioned previously, the correct observation, the accurate uh, perception, the explanation, rational explanation and experimental verification. The four steps which he explained in the same way, following those four steps, people started finding out new theories. They started understanding the natural facts and phenomena, And that is how science started growing. Now that time, the growth of science was so fast that the different, the science was growing at such a fast pace that different branches of science started bifurcating. The knowledge, see, we have studied classification of diseases. Now, exactly what is classification? That classification is dividing the facts and the phenomena into different groups so as to, it may be according to their similarities, so as to understand them and to explain them also. So when the science started growing at such a fast pace, so much of knowledge started gathering. And so they started classifying, they started dividing. And different branches of science came, like physics, chemistry, biology. And from that, another branch was the branch of medicine also. So this is how the bifurcation started. The different terms like terminology, nomenclature were also started being used. And so the growth of science started in this century. I've already explained to you about Lord Bacon. Now there was another philosopher, Denny Descripts. Uh, Bacon was a British philosopher. Descripts was a French philosopher. And he also, he was a father of subjective and idealistic philosophy. His philosophy was more idealistic. For the first time, as I told you previously also, that you, uh, you can find in the history of medicine, you can correlate it with our organon at all stages in different centuries. So this man, he was known as the Oracle of France. Oracle of France, René Descartes. Oracle means who is, who is a supreme, who is, who is an authority, who is very knowledgeable. So this man, for the first time, he explained the concept of individualization, which is our concept. He realized that this branch of medicine which is developing, 
but each man has got his own individual characters his own individuality which he adds to the disease also so this was the beginning of identifying the individuality of the sick and the sickness so that was the beginning where rene descartes for the first time explained he see idealistic philosophy so it was all ideal that which was moral that which was good for the mankind that was his philosophy and that what which was good for the mankind means you respect the individuality the likes dislikes of that person so this was the beginning of the scientific spirit then there were many other prominent see again i will tell you that throughout the presentation i have taken like as in the dark age i took only da vinci leonardo da vinci because there were so many other uh, contributors also but it's not possible to cover all the contributors so the ones who were the most prominent and who brought a change to the history of medicine i have only mentioned those people so the, among them one was galileo galilei he gave the relation between mechanics and measurements we know galileo famously for his telescope and he was the one who started seeing the stars the planets who started identifying the movement of the earth the movement of the moon because he had invented the telescope and as i told you previously also that they were the illuminates galileo is considered to be one of the illuminates because um, the uh, leonardo da vinci i told you that he was an illuminate and it is believed it is said that even today these group of illuminates are there all over the world and uh, they still decide cer certain major things for the countries so this is just a belief we don't know for sure but this is a secret organization but these are the people who are thinking ahead of their time so galileo was one such person just like as i told you that vinci was punished by the church because that he said certain things which were against the church and as i told you right from the primitive age the church was the authority so same happened with galileo also that because he was saying the truth he was explaining because the church had given certain concepts even in our indian culture that uh, whenever there was a solar eclipse then we believed that uh, rahu usko nigal gaya sun ko nigal gaya so these wrong concepts were there they did not realize the movements and when they are coming the sun moon and earth are coming in the same line and because of the shadow you are not able to see in lunar eclipse the moon and in solar the sun but see because these people said these things way back and so they were punished by the church because they were going against the concept of the church so same thing happened with galileo also then of course uh, william harvey what did william harvey did yes blood circulation the systemic circulation of blood was explained by him for the first time and so he actually he was the father of experimental medicine and midwifery midwife means the nurses so he brought this concept of nursing the patient that just medicines are not enough the nursing care of the patient is equally important to cure your patient so he was this person who brought this concept and the first thing the most important thing that he explained the circulatory system the systemic uh, circulation later on we'll come across that he too was punished so because you see these people said something which was correct but they said at such a time when people were not able to take it and the authorities were not ready to accept it and so they were punished so same thing happened with uh, harvey also of course robert boyle you know he was the person who is considered to be the father of chemistry see i told the different branches of science started developing on their own and in that one branch was chemistry and the boyle's famous boyle's law he described the idea gas and so he was the person who made many inventions and contributed in a big way to chemistry 
and Thomas Sindeham. Have you heard the name Thomas Sindeham? Where? Thomas Sindeham. Anyone can tell me? Yes, ma'am. Where? Loudly. Korea. Sindeham's Korea. Okay, you are saying in that way. Sindeham's Korea. Yeah, because he had described it. But see, in organon, I am talking about organon for the teachers of organon. In the introductory part of organon, we are, not the aphorisms, because we are doing with history of medicine, so we are not touching the aphorisms. But in the introductory part of organon, Thomas Sindeham is mentioned as the English Hippocrates, because he was a Britisher, and he is mentioned as in between Hippocrates and Hanuman. That is how he is described. So, Thomas, English Hippocrates, yes, but why he is mentioned? As I told you that, again, he was a person who followed and who supported Discrete's philosophy. And he said that each patient is an individual being. You cannot give the same medicine to all the patients. Each patient you have to examine. That is our concept of case taking. He had described it. The complete case taking of a person which includes everything has to be taken. And for that person, the medicine needs to be given. So he talked again of individuality. And he was the person who started using, giving medicines which were prepared from the plant kingdom. So that is why he was the one who started giving medicines. So he continued what Hippocrates had taught. He talked about individuality. But then what happened that when it came to giving medicines, he started ignoring the concept of individuality. He started using specific medicines according to the name or the cause of the disease. And therefore, it is said that he is in between Hippocrates and Hanuman. He talked about the concept. He wrote about the concept. But when it came to practice, he did not know how to implement it. And he started using specific medicines. That is according to the name of the disease. Specific medicines. Again, in the introductory part of the Organon, we come to know about the, the name, the diagnosis is done. So the person is suffering from malaria, then the diago must be given. So specific medicine, chloroquine must be given. So this is what he started doing in his practice. And therefore, he was considered in between Hippocrates and Hanuman. Now we come to the, as I told you that there were other contributors in the 17th century also, because it was a century of geniuses. So in the field of botany, in the field of physics, in the field of chemistry, many contributors were there, but we cannot cover all of them. 18th century, there was a plethora of theories and hypotheses related to disease, nature, cause, and therapeutics. Now, see, this was a century where there were so many well known philosophers, so many big names in the field of science and medicine. And each one started giving their own theories. Each one started explaining diseases and the treatment of diseases in their own ways. There were schools which developed with their own concept. A school which said, talked about mechanism, materialism, vitalism, naturalism. So different schools started developing. And it was a plethora. Plethora means excess. Excess of theories. And therefore, if you read Organon also, what is the first footnote? Theoretic medicine. In the very first footnote also, Hahnemann has mentioned that it is time the medicine of speculation is converted into the medicine of experience. Speculations, all speculations. If this will happen, this will happen, this will happen, then this must be given. So it was all speculations. So these medicines of speculations must be converted into medicine of experience. 
This is what Hahnemann has written in the first footnote, that it is now time. Speculations may be right, may be wrong. These are the hypotheses of one person or one group or one school of belief. These are their hypotheses. It may be correct, it may be incorrect. But from your experience, you learn that in a condition, in a disease, what is happening to the patient? If this is happening, then this should be his medicine. So here, the concept of treating the person as a whole, the concept of treating the individuality of the sick and the sickness, all these things Hahnemann realized because this was the century where there were so many theories. But when these theories were put into practice, many a times the ideal cure did not was not uh, the result. The cure was not ideal. There was sometimes palliation. There was sometimes suppression. Sometimes there were unwanted aggravations because of these theories. So this is the time where there were many theories, but still the real cure was not achieved. This concept, as I said, that everywhere in medicine of in the history of medicine, you can find that what thinking, what research Dr. Hahnemann must have done, that he had covered all these things in Organa. And therefore, you can correlate this with the footnote of first, very first footnote. He has mentioned this, that there were so many theories, but in practice, they were not useful, they were not fruitful. And these different schools, which are again mentioned in the introductory part of Ergenon, which were prevalent in the 18th century mechanism that they considered man as a machine. And so they treated only the part which was affected. Right? Again, the first uh, aphorism. That only the part which is affected was treated. We say the man is sick and therefore the knee is paining. The knee is paining, so only the knee has to be treated. This was the concept, mechanism. That man was considered as a machine. Because see, if you see a machine, any machine, take a simple pen also. There are so many parts which are put together. So primary, it is complex. And then secondary, it is made simple. And it functions as a single unit. So this is what is a machine. And so if one part is not working, you remove that part, you repair it, and you can put it again, or you replace it. We, in homeopathy, or in the theory of chronic disease, Hahnemann has explained that we, primary, we are simple, and secondary, we are complex. Because as you know, that when the ovum is fertilized by the sperm and the zygote is formed, from a single cell, it can be any living being, from a single cell, the multitude of cells are produced, millions of cells. So we have got a single life force which evolves into numerous functions, numerous organs, numerous uh, veins, arteries, etc. So we cannot be considered just as a machine. But there was a school of thought where the theory of mechanism was prevalent during that time. Another school of thought who believed in materia pecans, materialism, that is materia pecans, material cause of diseases. They wanted to find out that there is some impurity in the blood in the body of a person and therefore he was suffering. The same concept that there are bacteria and therefore this disease has happened. There is a virus, there is materia pecans, material causes of disease. In that era, the materia, the materia pecans or the material causes was impurities in the blood. If there is a skin condition which is not getting cured, then the blood is impure. If there is a pleurisy which is not getting cured, blood is impure. If the loy me bagad hai, see this is what they commonly say. Loy bigar gaya hai. Wo khun bigar gaya hai. So this is, they were believing in theories where they were trying to search the materia pecans. Not only trying to search the materia pecans, but trying to remove the materia pecans. And therefore, these methods of leaching, cupping, venisection, 
were all prevalent during that time, which is again mentioned in article. Veni section. The veins of the person were cut and the blood was allowed to flow so that the impurity is just going on. It is like it is taken out of the body. It is drained from the body. Now this was the method which was very prevalent. If you have written, uh, if you have read the biography of Dr. Hanneman by Richard Hale, he has written there that this venesection was so prevalent during this time. And when he left his practice and started uh, doing the experiments for homeopathy and started practicing homeopathy at that time, where Hanuman was staying, the prince was suffering maybe from pleurisy. And the royal physician, the physician who was just for the kings, the royal physician was performing venesection on the prince and it was in a fortnight. It was performed twice. And finally the prince died. As usual, Dr. Hanuman had that courage, that audience appear, dare to be wise. That at that time also when he was nothing, he was a struggling physician. He had difficulty to make, uh, make both his ends meet. But still at that, that time he wrote that the prince died because of the wrong methods used by the royal physician. And there was such an uproar and that he wrote it publicly in a pamphlet, which was published every fortnight. He wrote there for the royal physician. Now see, royal physician, he is the highest authority. And he wrote this, that because of this inhuman, see he had, we say this methods are inhuman. Jangli, which is not human. So, inhuman methods of drawing the blood of a sick person and because of that the prince has died even in patients who were suffering from panorangia and who were fair looking plethoric looking then they thought that she is having excess of blood and so the excess of blood must be drained away with venesection now see already panorangia the patient is losing blood she has become anemic and they were using such methods. Application of leech. Leech is an insect which draws the blood, which is still going on. I don't know here, but in Gujarat, there is a place where there is a farm where they cultivate leech. And people go there for uh, treatment of uh, psoriasis, eczema, some other uh, treatments also, even for some phobias. And uh, they go for that leech application, thinking that the blood is not pure. Now see, yes, we know that no impurities can stay in the blood. It's a nature's mechanism to throw out any impurities if it is in the blood. But these were the wrong concepts which were prevalent in this century, this era, thinking that mechanism, materialism, the third one, vitalism, which is our concept, that they believed that there is an energy, there is a force which is animating the material body and which is responsible for governing the harmonious functions of the material body to see that it remains in the physiological order of functioning. And if it is disturbed, then the disease is caused. So that was the third concept which matched which the, with the concept of homeopathy and naturalism, that is the diseases are natural phenomena and so can be treated with the natural crude form of medicines only. So using the plant kingdom more and in a crude form. So these were the different schools in 18th century. Though the 17th century was the century of geniuses, the 18th century had plenty of theories, plenty of literature, hypothesis, methods of treatment, but the desired cure for the suffering mankind was yet not achieved. So these two centuries were still the century of chaos. The primitive ages, the previous middle age was centuries of wrong beliefs and superstitious conceptions and uh, supernatural powers. But this scientific spirit had started but for diseases for suffering mankind had still not benefited 
Now the uh, outstanding contributors of the 18th century, Sir Isaac Newton, as we previously mentioned in inductive logic, the gravitational force, which was very important discovery and by which many things got solved, which man was not able to understand. Of course, Dr. Samuel Hahnemann, as I said, that he was the one who realized about vitalism. He was the one who talked about that the speculations are wrong, the methods of treatment which are used presently are wrong. The medicines which must be used must be previously experimented, must be tested, proved on human beings only. He talked about individuality. He talked about the vital force, the vitalism. And as well as he gave the concept of chronic disease because of his method of drug dynamization. Because of drug dynamization, he was able to use the minimum dose. Because of the minimum dose, he was coming, he came to the concept of vital force. Because he came to the concept of vital force, he came to the concept of miasms. Because he came to the concept of miasms, we are able to cure chronic diseases. And because we are able to cure chronic diseases, we are able to give fight to the allopathic science. So this was the whole cycle. So the Samuel Hahnemann, father of experimental pharmacology, employed law of similia, discovered primary and secondary action of medicine. He wrote Arginan of medicine, which was revised six times, which was a big contribution to homeopathy. And he was bold enough, he was honest enough to revise it six times. Otherwise, once you write or once you say something, you stick to your point. You don't change that. But he kept on revising. There is an augmented edition. There is a revised edition. So whatever new concepts came to his mind, after 40 years, he came to the concept of chronic disease and he included Materia Medica Pura. He proved 99 drugs before he died. And he wrote the volumes of chronic diseases also. Then there was one Von Heller who wrote 12 books of physiology, four books of anatomy and seven books on botany. John Hunter is invaluable contribution to pathology, surgery and anatomy and comparative physiology. See Hunter again, one more thing which he had described because at that time the wars were going on. So he had described, he was, he was a, a big contributor to, to pathology, but in that, he had described the gunshot wounds also. And because he had described the gunshot wounds, the treatment for the gunshot wounds was found. And so because there were many wars which were going on at that time. So Hunter was known for his contribution to pathology. And of course, Edward Jenner, who found the vaccination for, for, for smallpox, for smallpox, a disease which was devastating the humankind where thousands of people were dying and thousands other were getting other permanent disabilities like if you read in organ or not so what happens when two similar diseases come together dr hanuman has given examples that smallpox can produce permanent deafness it can produce permanent chronic ophthalmia that is causing blindness. It can cause ophritis. It can cause dysentery like symptoms for the life. So not only the death of people, but smallpox was responsible for many other conditions which were lifelong. It can produce the disfiguring of the face because the smallpox scars never go for your life. So the face can become disfigured. The blindness was very common. So Edward Jenner's biggest contribution was the concept of vaccination. He saw, you must be knowing, that he saw in the cow herds, the, uh, the workers who were working with the cow, and they were uh, milking the cows. And they did not suffer from cowpox, because at that time cowpox was going on, and they did not suffer. And so from that, he realized that there is something which is making this people uh, immune. And so he injected him in himself. And that is how the smallpox vaccine, that is again a big thing. So that is how he found out the smallpox vaccination. So this was his big contribution in this century. This is Newton Hahnemann. Now we come to the 19th century. It was beginning of organized advancement of science. 
This was now, as I said, that the 17th and 18th century was century of geniuses, but there was still chaos in the field of medicine. No permanent methods of cure were established. But then in the 19th century, science got streamlined. It started working in a way which was good for the or which was comfortable for the patients. The methods which were used, the medicines which were used became less harm, harmful and less inhuman. So here this in the 19th century, the real advancement of science started. This was the century when man was given the prime importance. The prime importance was the sick person. And according to the needs of the man, the different methods started evolving. Now, in, the, in that, these are the outstanding uh, contributor, uh, contributors. I talked about midwife. So, one was Florence Nightingale, whose role was very important in starting the nursing practice. Because at that time, the world wars were going on. And as I said, the gunshot wounds and all those wounds were very common. Amputations of the limbs was also very common. And so to look after the sick, Florence was her name and Nightingale was, a, no, Florence was the name of the place and Nightingale was the name which was given to her. Nightingale means a bird who sings very sweetly. So she was looking after the patients in such a sweet way, so much care. And with her nursing care, many of the patients, sepsis was controlled. Necrosis was controlled. They were amputation can be avoided. So she became she was the one who started that nursing care is equally important for treating your patient. Only medicines are not enough. So that was one. Sir Charles Bell he discussed two types of nerves that that is the sensory and the motor nerves. Gray of course anatomy. As I said, Vincy was the father of anatomy because dissected or he drew without having any facilities in the middle of the night he drew the he saw the bodies and he drew the pictures but gray published his anatomy book on anatomy which is uh, which was uh, maybe some of the senior teachers must have read the gray anatomy nowadays students read chorasia and but when we studied there was no chorasia so we had to read only gray uh, still i have preserved my gray anatomy so and then uh, Augusto Wallet, who had talked, uh, who, who concept of local anesthesia. See, I told you the man became the prima factor. So the comfort of the sick was taken into consideration. So this anesthesia came. Then Louis Pasteur, you must have heard his name. He found the method of uh, preventing putrefaction known as pasteurization. On his name, this word pasteurization, which we still use for milk. Usually we drink milk which is pasteurized, so which is a common thing. He was the pioneer of preventive medicine due to the germ theory of disease. And his con uh, contribution of anti rabies vaccine was also very important. Now see this man also, he was a very brilliant person, not only in work, but uh, it's not only in one uh, uh, field, but he contributed in a big way to medicine. First of all, he did not have a microscope. Because at that time, microscopes were not invented. But still, without the microscope, he realized that there is some germs. See, he called germs, which we now call bacteria. But he said that there are germs which spoils the food items or the things. Putrefication means it spoils, decays. So he realized this and then how to remove it. And he found out this method of purifying, which is very commonly even today used for the purification of milk and to preserve milk for a long time. In Gujarat, we have got famous Amul dairy. And from there, the milk is supplied all over in India. Not only in India, in US also I have seen milk of uh, Amul dairy. So it is supplied all over the world. And this to preserve this milk for many days and to keep it pure, it can be ingested to keep it 
in a state where it can be ingested. This method of pasteurization, which is on the name of Louis Pasteur, is still used. So that was his contribution. And again, rabies, a disease which was not understood by mankind. Previously, the supernatural theories was that he is again possessed by a spirit or koi demon a gaya hai, body camera, and therefore that arch is formed and you are not able to control. And the patient was chained, kept in a dark room, then uh, water was thrown on such patients. And this man, he found out the anti rabies vaccination by which it was very helpful to the humankind. So these were the big contributors of the 19th century. This is Florence Nightingale, Louis Pasteur. Then yes, as I said, that uh, Louis Pasteur realized that there is a germ which is causing the decaying and putrefaction of the different uh, food items or something which is causing, which is dirty and which is not causing the things to remain good, in a good shape. Now, Robert Cox was known for his study of bacteria using an oil lensing microscope. In 1882, his biggest triumph was discovering the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now see, this is again the credit is given to Cox. But we teachers of Organon, we know, we call Dr. Hahnemann father of bacteriology. Louis Pasteur said it is a germ. He did not have a microscope. If you read chronic diseases, chronic disease was in which edition of Organon? Fourth edition of Organon. Good. And it was published in which year? Students. Published in which year? Fourth edition of Organon was published in which year? 1829. Very good. So, 1829, chronic diseases was published. And in the theory of chronic diseases, uh, sorry, in uh, describing the chronic diseases, Dr. Hahnemann had mentioned the Asiatic cholera, which was prevailing in Asia and where people were dying in thousands. Again, the Asiatic cholera, just like smallpox, it was taking the life of many, many people and especially in India. Even if you read Gandhi's biography, Mahatma Gandhi's biography, then you will find instances that when he was not allowed to go in a town or a city because it was quarantined, because of cholera. So till then it was so prevalent. Now in way back in 1829, also in his chronic diseases that was written in 1825, he wrote that maybe this cholera is due to Plenty of miasmatic beings, plenty of animated miasmatic beings, which are so small that which cannot be seen by the naked eye and which are responsible for spreading this contagion. Now see, this is 1825. Again, Dr. Hahnemann did not have the microscope. He had not come to India. He had not come to Asia also. So he was writing this without a, without a microscope. But he said that maybe cholera is due to miasmatic. Miasmatic means, at that time, miasmatic means which is causing a disease, which is causing sickness, that is miasmatic. And animated, animated means they are moving. They have got mood, moment. They have got life. So animated miasmatic beings, which are plenty in number, but they are so small, so minute, that they cannot be seen by the naked eye. And they may be responsible for the contagion of cholera. That is what Hahnemann had written. To that extent, he also wrote that it is very prevalent in the sailors who stay on the bank of river Ganges. This is written. 
So, Bank of River Ganges means in India. At that time, their transportation was very poor. So, the rivers were the main source of navigation. People used to do all the business through rivers. So, there were so many boats which were on the banks of River Ganges, Ganga. And in those rivers, the, there is dampness because it is in the water. The boats are uh, lodged in the water. So, there is dampness, there is darkness. And the sailors are staying in a close, compact mass. Poor sanitation. They defecate very nearby and there only they cook the food. And therefore, the cholera contagion is spreading in these sailors. And then these sailors go to the town, wherever they have lodged their boat, they go to that city or the town. And so they are spreading, they are giving the contagion to the other population also. Now see, till then, Dr. Hanneman also had this material concept. And if you teach uh, chronic disease, then how his materialistic con concept got to the, converted to the dynamic concept, that is another thing. But here, he had precisely described the bacterias. He had not given the name bacterias, but he had described that they are miasmatic animated beings. Beings means living. Plantain number. So minute that cannot be seen by the naked eye. But they are responsible for spreading cholera. So he had precisely described a bacteria without a microscope and without using, coining the name bacteria. Now this I am talking about 1825 he had written. And he had then again written in 1829 in the uh, edition of Organon, 4th edition. 1882. Almost 50 years after that, Cox came to India with a microscope. Hanuman did not come to India. Cox came to India with a microscope. And there he saw in the intestine of the dead, in the fecus of the uh, living who were suffering, he saw these cholera bacillus. And he gave this, he said he became the uh, father of bacteriology. That he coined this name bacteria and he found out the tubercular and the uh, cholera bacillus. And therefore tuberculosis is still known as Cox disease because he found out. But Hahnemann had talked about it way 50 years before that. And then later on, in India, they had uh, uh, created an experiment also. They prepared a broth from the infected people, uh, this thing, uh, infected material. And that broth was ingested by almost 25 people. And cholera was not produced in them. Then this experiment was again repeated by a man called Patrick Moore. This is, uh, I think, so mentioned in Stuart Claus that this experiment was again repeated in Paris and again they ingested that broth and cholera was produced only one person and it was fatal and so they stopped the experiment. Now see, again, our concept of susceptibility plays a role. The materia fecans is there but the disease is not produced. Right? Because the person is not susceptible or the vital force is not damaged. Every day we inhale viruses and bacteria, we eat viruses and bacteria, but we don't become sick. Why? Because we are not susceptible or our vital force is not damaged. So, this experiment also proves the Hahnemannian concept of diseases. So, this was about this famous man, Robert Cox, who, was, who gave this theory, the germ theory and the bacteria theory. Then again, a very known name was of Sigmund Freud. He started the discipline of psychoanalysis. Till then, the mental diseases, the phobias, the different types of uh, uh, schizophrenia were not considered. Again, the supernatural theories were used for all mental conditions. So, he was the one who started the analysis, the diagnosis of such mental conditions. Again, the same thing. We have got psychotherapy described in Organa. 
in the very first edition of Organon, that is, which was published in the year 1810. In the first edition of Organon, 210 to 230 aphorisms are for mental diseases, types of mental diseases. And in aphorism 228, 229, psychotherapy is described. 1810. Freud wrote his first book on psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. Even Carl Ung, both of them wrote in 1910. That was 50 years, this is 100 years. 100 years before, Hahnemann understood the mental illnesses which were genuine which caused so much of discomfort to the man, the person who was suffering and to the family. People neglected it, did not understand it. But he was, again, Hahnemann had realized this in his very initial days. Out of poverty, he had no source of income. So the governor of Transylvania had helped him to get a job in an asylum. You must have read in the biography. And in Richard Hale's biography, if you read, Richard Hale says that when he worked in that asylum for a few months only, seven to eight months, because he had shortage of money and so he had to travel from uh, travel from one, one place to another place. So just when he was working in the asylum, he started removing the practice of beating the patient, the mental illness patients, the chaining of the patients. Instead of that, he started giving psychotherapy to that patient in his own way. And during his stay of just few months, the curative rate, the discharge which were given to the patient had increased by 20%, almost 20%. So just again, you can realize the genius of Dr. Hahnemann that 100 years before he had realized that there are conditions which are related to the mind and they cannot only be cured by medicines where psychotherapy is must, which is our strong point today also, that in allopathy they don't have medicines for these conditions. They can give them sedatives or they can give them mood elevators, but we can take the totality of symptoms, we can do the case per civic and we can cure such patients. So, and the famous inc incidents of uh, Klockenberg, the minister of one of the kings who was very clever and he had a mental condition and Hahnemann had stayed in isolation with that person. He had not even allowed the wife of the person to come to meet uh, him because uh, there can be any aggravating factors. So he was staying in a castle. Ek, uh, killa hota hai wo castle mein. He was staying with this minister and he had cured him completely. And after that, Hanuman had very, become very famous for mental conditions, but then he left the town and went away because people of mental conditions started coming to him from all over Germany. And he did not want to get himself stereotyped in one type of diseases only. So he left and he went from that town, he left that town and went away. So, but this is what, see, as I told you that if you read the history of medicine, why it is so important to us? Because then you realize the genius of uh, Dr. Hahnemann and what contributions he had given. So this was uh, uh, the uh, story of Freud. He was again very well known, uh, well known for his theory of Oedipus complex. He gave that theory of Oedipus complex for the first time. Uh, Oedipus complex means Rajiv knows. So I want somebody else to say Oedipus complexes. Yes. Ego, ego, yes. Super ego and that is also Oedipus complex. That is, of course, ego is there, but then how it is developed. Pardon? Oral. Gratification for a child, yes, that is right, correct. O oral gratification for a child. See, it is more or less the beginning of your life, the childhood. And 
it is said that this complex it is idealizing for the opposite sex right from childhood the son is more connected to the mother and the daughter is more connected to the father so that attraction starts and you get more gratification from the opposite in your parents and that is the role which plays a very vital role in the upbringing of your child and the development of ego that how this correlation or the attraction which a child develops in childhood this is there is a big uh, this thing uh, volumes which are written by him for this oedipus complex and that is how the growth of the child takes place see and therefore it is important that in our history taking also we take history of childhood his relations with the parents especially and that plays a very ro big role in the development of the child in the development of that personality of that person and the outlook of that person for the society because there the beginning is there and from there it grows that how the child will be so the characters the different emotions of grief depression vindictiveness jealousy see this is there is the beginning where it starts so that he has described very beautifully and after that there was kal an who was a disciple of freud they worked together for 7 years but then because freud was more emphasizing on the sexuality on the opposite sex and he was not able he was not convinced by only this factor and so they separated he said that there are other psychological factors subconscious factors which are playing a very important role the subconscious factors which play a very important role in developing a personality of a person especially the mental state and so he separated and he emphasized more on the dreams kal young emphasized more on the dreams and in one of the this thing rajiv had told me there is one book which is the weavers of the night but it is like examine your life by the weavers of night that book which is written where it is like a journey from ang to hanuman see the concept of taking the history of childhood the relation with the parents the relation in the society and talking about the dreams also these are all psychological concepts which came 100 years after hanuman but we find that to individualize our patient we take all this into consideration and then and then we form the totality of symptoms on which we select the seminal so you can just realize why i keep keep on correlating with history of medicine dr hanuman that you should realize that how was his genius and in writing of organon so many things he has incorporated with which had happened before his time and after his time but he has incorporated everything into organon and therefore organon is considered to be the highest watermark of medical philosophy no medical philosophy is as complete as what organon of medicine is it so that is about the contributors of course the 20th century we live in this century this period is known as the golden age of medicine as there are many advancement in medical science the main system of medicine is allopathy various sources of drugs mineral animal vegetable and synthesized sources of medicine are there so this is we are living in it this can be again a for six hour session if we are going to talk about the 20th century there are so many advancement and now medicine has not become static at all new advancement new growth is coming every day there are so many people there are so many organization the who is contributing so much money for the advancement of medicine surgical methods so this was about the different centuries now as i told you in the beginning only 
that I will take. I will be taking the centuries for the history of medicine, and then we will be taking some of the important civilizations who contributed in the growth of medicine. Again, I would like to say that this is not a very interesting topic, but I'm trying to see that uh, maybe some of you are maybe feeling sleepy, but we. Because this is a topic which is given to me, so it cannot be as good as teaching aphorisms. To teach an aphorism is better than to teach this. But anyway, so these are the important uh, civilization, the Mesopotamian medicine, Indus Valley civilization, that is our Indian medicines, Egyptian medicines, Roman and the Chinese, some important contributors. Now, first we take Mesopotamia means the land between the rivers, the meaning of the word Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is the land between the ancient river Euphrates and Tigris. It is called the cradle of Sarah. See, uh, the land between river Euphrates and Tigris is now known as Iraq. Presently, we call it Iraq. So this is about that civilization. Where you, this is again an old civilization where you find the growth of medicine. Now, why it is called the cradle of civilization? Because this was the place where the consider consideration or the ethics for medicine science started. This is the place that irrespective of the caste and creed, irrespective of the financial status, whether the person is rich or poor, irrespective of from whatever caste, whatever society he is coming, as a physician, you have to treat that person. So, the discrimination between different classes, different caste, was taken out from this civilization. And therefore, it is known as the cradle, the beginning of civilization. Because equality, the concept of equality came in this civilization. But here again, in the initial days, it was practiced in this civilization. There were herb doctors, internists, knife doctors who were called the surgeons, and the spell doctors who were the psychiatrists. So this was the beginning in Mesopotamia. Here, there were the herb doctors who were using the plant kingdom Again, see, you can see just like the 17th and 18th century, there were groups, divisions. In all civilizations, you'll find this. Because that we have talked about the centuries. The centuries are implemented to all the civilizations. It is implied. So here again, there were groups. There were a group of people who believed only on using the plants for treatment. So they were known as the herb doctors. Then there were the knife doctors who believed in using the crude surgical instruments. As I told you that initially the crude instruments started and they were used for minor surgical process where the stripping and everything started. So this was the part where they were using some crude surgical instruments and of course again the witch doctors or the spell doctors. Again the concept of psychiatric diseases was not there so these were the spells spell means uh, jadu right so again those spell doctors were there which we described in the primitive ages that they were having methods which were again sometimes inhuman so because their concepts were wrong and so they were using wrong methods of treatment as i said that it is the gods are offended or the body is possessed by an evil spirit or somebody has done some ill craft or witchcraft on your on that person so this is the concept and so they were also using spells and so they were doing those uh, different types of uh, fires were used different colors of cloth were used they had to wear it or they had to put it in front of their houses then bracelets and amulets were given to the people to wear, uh, like some bracelet that the patient has to wear. So such uh, amulets were given. Then uh, there was using of blood of animals for uh, I mean, sacrifices were done of the animals. Sometimes the, even the human blood was used 
for certain rituals. So this again was the stage at that time also. So there was a fertile doll which was used. If the pair, the women was not having children, then sterile, for sterility the fertile dolls were given. So if you read the history of medicine, some some places you find, uh, especially the book which is written by Dr. Harish Chand Divan, you find the pictures of this uh, fertile dolls and those uh, amulets which were given or something to hang in front of your ha house, some masks were given. So these were the methods which were used in the beginning. The Sumerians started practicing cuneiform system of writing. And the oldest prescription comes from the Mesopotamia dating to 2100, 2100 BC. And treatment were returns on tablets. Now see this cuneiform system of writing started. Cuneiform system of writing means they did not have the alphabets. But they, they had different shapes. So that was known as the cuneiform form of writing. Shapes like if it was a shape of a Y or a uh, X or a circle or a triangle or a rectangle. So these different shapes were used. And the shapes had a meaning. Now how they wrote this on mud or clay. It was written on the clay or on the mud, like wedges. It was written in the form of wedges. And this mud or clay was then dried up. So for this disease, this was the symbol. And then it was dried up. And so that symbol, they understood that this was, must be given. This medicine must be given. So for different diseases, the name of the disease and the medicine or the method of treatment to be used that was the cuneiform form of writing. This was the advancement which had started. The crude form of the medical books which had started. And this was done on mud which was dried up. So it remained for a longer period of time. On wet mud they used to write the name of the disease and the medicine or the treatment, method of treatment. And then they used to dry it up. And the best part of it was that these tablets can be transported from one place to another place also. So it was transported to other places also. So if one person who was knowing medicine, who was practicing medicine, and if he wrote, then his methods can be given to another place also, to another people also, and another people also can learn from it. So this is how this was uh, advancement. In the very initial advancement in the field of medicine, and this is how it started. So this was the beginning of writing treatment, right? Writing prescriptions. That now, as we write prescriptions, this was the very crude form of writing prescriptions. Now see, even this word which Rx, which means treatment, right? Prescription means we write Rx. Now, this is also a symbol of the eye of Horus, which was taken out by a demon. It has a story. Now, this is the shape, the eye of a person called Horus, which was taken out by a demon. So, see, that spell thing was still going on. Though the advancement was starting, so they wrote this because they wanted to evade the evils in their writings. What we say na Najar Nalajar. So this was a symbol which was made, this treatment which we write till today also. It is the symbol of the eye of Horus, which was removed by a demon, uh, Rakshas by a demon. And so this eye, this uh, symbol was given to people to bear also and to hang it out their houses so that the evils may not affect them. So you can keep it outside their house. Even see today in India also we keep a horseshoe in the, in the entrance of our house so that uh, uh, some evil spirit may not come. So this is the traditions which were going on. These were the first prescriptions. And some other important contribution of this era was cloth and textiles came. 
So people started using, making cloths out of uh, cotton. As I told you that the will came and when the will came, the farming started, the harvesting started and so many other different things started. Then the seals were made, for, then there were astrological tables, the study of the stars where India had a big influence for the astrological study. Many things were in, uh, adopted from the Indian culture. Mining of the ore started. The solar calendar, again, the influence of India was there in preparing the solar cal calendar. As I told you that when many people came to India to learn, and especially they learned Ayurveda. Weights and measures started. The will, which I told you previously also, which changed, which brought a revolution. Irrigation and harvesting of crops. They started growing crops from hunters. They became farmers. And so they started using the vegetal, uh, vegetation or the uh, vegetable kingdom for medicines also. Biggest contribution of Mesopotamia of, to medicine was the code of ethics laid down by King Hammurabi of Babylon, 1728 to 1680 BC, uh, before Christ, which described the conduct of physicians and the guidelines for health practitioners. It was first codification of medical practice. King Hammurabi, who had written the code of ethics. See, later on, Hippo Hippocratic Oath came. But before that, it was for the first time that those who practiced medicine, a code was given, code of ethics. Even in Organon, the first two aphorisms are ethics. The mission of a physician and what is the highest ideal of cure. They are more of morality, of the ethics. You don't do palliation, you don't do suppression. Your mission, your, your goal, your birth is just for curing the patients and restoration of health. It should be something mission means. It is not an imposition, but it is an instinct. From inside you feel that you want to cure your patient. Nobody is punishing you. It is not an imposition. So... There is no word like responsibility or aim or goal. The word mission is used. So it is more of ethics, organon also, first two aphorisms. Then we start with the knowledges of a physician and later on it goes on. But the first thing, the first ethics was laid down by this man. And in that, he had mentioned around 282 laws, which a physician must follow. 282 laws he has described for the physician. All that is good, beneficial for the patient is described over here. How the patient must be treated, how the physician must be, be must behave, what must be his approach. But still, this code of conduct which was written, the code of ethics which was written, is known as the draconian law. Why it was known as the draconian law? Because most of the part was correct was uh, essential but there were some inhuman concepts also and so it was named as the draconian law because if a physician is successful in curing his patients he must be appreciated he must be awarded but say if a physician fails to cure his patient then his hands must be chopped off now see, this was the draconian part. This was the wrong part. That if a physician fails in curing, then he must be punished. And punished very severely. And publicly. So, this was the wrong part. And which was very strictly followed. A very inhuman practice which was strictly followed for the physician. Though there was social evolution, the medicine was devoid of scientific foundation. Mesopotamia was cradle of magic and necromancy. What is necromancy? What is necromancy? It is talking to the dead. So they believe that there are some spirits, the one who are, who are dead, will guide you in treatment. See, your advancement had started. Cotton had come. Harvesting had come. Crops had started. There was so much of advancement. The ethics had come. The code had come. The writing, cuneiform form of writing had come.
but still as i mentioned previously the spell doctors were also there so they believed that there are spirits souls atma who after their death also they are looking after the health of their family and for treating certain diseases these spirits must be called there are some spirits which are universal there are some spirits which are for the family a grandfather or a grandmother or somebody who is who is that who has died in the family if a person was suffering because the grandmother is offended and so you have to do certain things for the grandmother who is a soul who is a spirit and if that soul is satisfied then you will flourish or the disease will go or there are certain universal souls or spirits good spirits which will help you in curing so they were talking to the dead they had all those magics i said no that budu craft then the black cloth and uh, giving of blood and every sacrifices so they had those witches which uh, they like budu craft they used to do that tantric uh, thing and so they had those uh, dark places and uh, the bones and everything was kept and then they were calling that spirit and talking to that dead people and deciding the method of treatment so certain things still went on those civilization had started but there were things which are, even today also it goes on it is not new still also it is going on now the greek medicine so from the iraq part we come to the greek medicine and yes uh, here this is again the european part we are coming to the european countries the greeks are con considered to be the civilizers of the ancient world they taught why and how see what we are uh, discussing since morning why and how inductive logic again asking questions and finding out the answers which are rational so here in greek this spirit started in europe as i said the writings of lord bacon and rene descartes these two people were responsible for starting the scientific spirit in the entire europe and so here the beginning of civilization started they asking they started asking questions and they started disobeying the priest finding out the answers now here the early leader was asclepius the son of goddess apollo now see greek had many greeks and romans they had many god and goddesses for everything they had god and goddesses for beauty for children for child bearing so for everything for the mountains for the rivers for the sea so everything they had god and goddesses so for bringing rain so just like our indian culture we have got batris karod devi devdas so same was with, with greek and romans they had many god and goddesses so asclepius who was considered to be the son of goddess apollo he was the symbol of medicine now where in organon we come across asclepius have you heard this word asclepius in organon precursor very good precursor of organon it is asclepius in balance is one of the precursor of organon just like medicine of experience in 1805 so many many uh, hanuman has said that these were some of the things which he has taken in organon he had taken from the precursors the forerunners from the books which were previous to dr hanuman and from which he had adopted certain things so asclepius was such an authority and asclepius in balance he had written certain things and he was such a authority and he was considered to the be the person who started the medical philosophy the medical methods of treatment in greek and he was uh, see still we use his uh, symbol his symbol was of a uh, uh, shaft with the serpent around it he was carrying a shaft with a serpent a snake around it and that has become the symbol of medical faculty till today so that was his authority that was his contribution that the shaft which was carrying uh, the, the the stick 
and on that stick there was a, the serpent which was coiled around that stick the snake was coiled and that became the symbol of uh, medical fraternity so he was a person who wrote lots of literature who practiced medicine and his practice of medicine was considered but see he was more or less like god he was not considered as a physician because these were the initial days so he was able to remove diseases and so he was considered as a god it was a practice in greek at that time to keep the statue of aesculapius with that uh, serpent with that shaft in their houses also so he was considered to be the god of health and his statues his pictures were kept in different houses so as that the diseases don't enter that house so that was his authority and he had two daughters who were also worshiped as goddesses as i said see they were not actually god and goddesses but they were the people who were able to remove the diseases and so they were given the dignity of god and goddesses for us also people come and say ki aapke jaisa to bhagwan bhi nahi hai mujhe itne saalon se ye ho raha tha ki ye acha ho gaya so ab we are next to god so many a times the patient also give us that credit so here also the same thing happened that they were worshiped like god hygia was the goddess of health from which the word hygiene came and panacea was the goddess of medicine see now again they both created dynasties which were curative and preventive as i said we can correlate with organa third aphorism the knowledge is of a physician or a therapeutist curative therapeutist and fourth aphorism he is likewise a preserver of health so preventive so these were the two big concepts which the greek philosophy philosophy gave that not only curing people but preventing disease is also as important we saw during covid we had faced the biggest pandemic and we saw that how the prevention was equally important the wearing of mask and what everything we had started all of us have experienced it that how important is prevention so the curative and the preventive concept which we have got in organon in the very beginning in the third and fourth aphorism this was the beginning where it started in the greek dynasty see this is the shark with the snake aesculapius was the helen's god of medicine see helen's was the name of the town where he practiced so he was considered as a god as i told many temples were built to worship him and they were the first schools of medicines where enemas baths massages were given now see as people were thinking not considering him as a doctor but as a god temples were built in his name and these temples were nothing but hospitals in the temples there were people who were taught how to give different therapies and these people were called priest but actually they were not priest they were giving nursing care to the patient they were just like doctors but in the initial age these places were not known as hospitals but they were known as temples of aesculapius there are so many literature on temples of aesculapius they were all around in europe also not only greek but in entire europe it had spread it and these temples actually the worship was that giving nursing care to the sick that was the worship over there and the doctors there were known as priests and in these temples aesculapius methods were practiced then besides aesculapius say as i said that uh, they were known as priest or sage sage means uh, saint saints so these were not not known as uh, doctors now aesculapius had seven main sages who were his followers and each of the sage developed different methods of treatment aesculapius seven sages they developed their own methods of treatment for different disease conditions they started having their own temples so there were seven other stage uh, sages disciple of one another 
so that is how it started and in that seven sages thales was one of the very important sage or a doctor he was the father of science measured the length he was not only a doctor but not only a person who was related to medicine as i said they were not doctors they were called sages so he was good at arithmetic also he measured the length of the pyramids the egyptian pyramids by their sh uh, shadow drew angles and circles and activated theorems so he was good in geometry arithmetic and he predicted the eclipse of sun see i told you till then man was not able to understand the solar and lunar eclipse but he was the man who talked about it he wrote about it so this is how the entire esculapius dynasty started in greece and then with the with his disciple it spread it further and further not only these seven sages but the priest who were working in the temples of esculapius the priest also they started having their own groups own uh, followers and they started teaching them also so the priest also they also started advancing so this was thales the greatest physician in greek medicine was hippocrates the father of medicine he epitomized greek medicine see hippocrates we all know we all have heard about hippocrates who is considered to be the father of medicine in allopathic science they take the hippocratic oath like we take the hanumanian oath the he is considered as the father of medicine so in his name when you pass out when you graduate you take a oath in his name now this hippocrates was son of one of the priest of esculapius temple he was related he was a son of one of the priest of the esculapius because as i said there were many temples and in that many temples there were many doctors who were known as priest the spiritual concept was religious concept was there and one of the priest son was hippocrates so he became a very very big authority in the field of medicine and many of his teachings are still prevailing and still people follow many of the hippocratic teaching he was the biggest contributor among all in the field of medicine and even in organon also in the commentaries of organon it is mentioned that he talked about the law of similia hippocrates also talked about the law of similia and he said that sometimes the dissimilar medicines are good sometimes the similar medicines are to be given so he also talked about law of similia hippocrates challenged the tradition of magic in medicine he studied disease on observation and reasoning and application of clinical methods in medicine see just like us unprejudiced observer what we talked in the morning that like observation of your patient reasoning that is perceiving your patient the third aphorism the physician has to perceive what is to be cured so perceiving your patient that is reasoning and application of clinical methods in medicine Hippocrates writings and lectures are compiled as Corpus Hippocratium 72 volumes were in the first century see he had written the clinical pictures of diseases in 72 volumes just imagine the contribution of that man so way back to write 72 clinical pictures in volumes that is not a small thing it is a very big achievement and so as i said previously that he was the biggest contributor among all in the field of medicine he separated medicine from religion and challenged the tradition of malik you see esculapius temples though he was the son of one of the priest he stopped this religious practice instead of that he started hospitals in real sense he he stopped this practice of uh medicine being practiced in temples he believed that body must be treated as whole so much of the hanumanian concept the person as a whole he was the first to accurately describe the symptoms of pneumonia and epilepsy so certain he had he had described many clinical pictures but he was some of the diseases he was not able to give the names but he had described many clinical pictures of different diseases and for that the medicines which are to be given 
He described fevers according to their intermittency. The four intermittent fevers, which we, which even Dr. Hanneman had described, the intermittent fevers, the four types. So the same concept way back Hippocrates had described. And we can see that what study Dr. Hanneman also had, that he had correlated so many civilizations, so many centuries in writing organon. He was the first to understand the power of nature, diet, cleanliness, fresh air to cure diseases, uh, community medicine, preventive medicine, which we now realize. He realized the concept of individualization, sensations, emotion, personality traits, and the balance of the four humors. See, individualization, sensations, emotions, personality traits. Our case taking is incomplete if we don't consider all these things. So, so much related to homeopathy and the four humors is related to Ayurveda. So, he was a man who was thinking so much ahead of his time. He had such a genius, such an intelligence that he had written about all these things. He developed the oath of medical ethics for physician. As I told you, the oath is taken in his name till today. Hippocrates wrote the book, Airs, Water and Places is a treatise on social medicine and hygiene. His concept of health and disease stressed the relation between man and his environment. So the community medicine, the concept of PSM was started by Hippocrates and he for the first time realized that what importance the environment, the external stimuli, the diet, the nature causes on production of a disease and prevention of a disease. What is the role of the environment for men? So these were some concepts which we believe today and we follow strongly. We have to follow, which Hippocrates said centuries back. So that is his contribution. Now his follower was Aristotle. As I told, Aesculapius, his priest, his son was Hippocrates. And after Hippocrates, Aristotle, who was a follower of Hippocrates. So he practiced, Aristotle was a very famous philosopher also. He was a storyteller. He was a writer. He wrote literature also. And he also talked about zoology. Uh, Aristotle also wrote about zoology. But he was a follower of Hippocrates. So he adopted many of the methods which were described by Hippocrates. So, a philosopher and a biologist who believed in the theory of four humors. Now, see here, as I told you in the very beginning, that during the Dark Age, many of the Europeans had come to India. And at that time, uh, at that time, Charak Rushi was at his peak. And so, they had learned Ayurveda from India and they had gone back also. So, in many of the olden civilization, the four humors, which is the concept of Ayurveda, are mentioned at various places. So this is our Indian influence on the European culture also. So this was the man Aristotle. As I said that he was a biologist, that is he wrote about the zoology, the classification of the different uh, vertebral and non-vertebral animals, that classification he had done. So that was in the beginning. Aristotle's contribution is he was the first to differentiate between the vertebrates from the non-vertebrates. He observed and described the beating of the embryos. He was uh, the embryologist and named the aorta also. He described the living world and its classification and theory of evolution. I said, as I told you, that he was more into biology, botanist. He was a botanist. He was a zoologist. So the evolution of life. He has described in his writings, he also was talking, he wrote uh, certain things about the embryology. He did not use the word embryo or egg, but he was the first one to give this concept that from one cell, the living beings are developing. Just as I told you previously, that we grow, we are primary, we are simple, and then secondary, we become complex, opposite of the machine. So this concept of growing from a single cell was described by Aristotle. These are 
Theophilus, he was the father of botany. So his science was also developing at the same time. So the botany, the plant kingdom, uh, the power of germination of the seed, then uh, described the method of collecting gums. So this was more, his contribution was more in botany. And this uh, gum, using the gums for medicine, he had advocated for the first time that these gums are secreted from the parts of different uh, trees and which can be used for uh, treatment. Herophilus, he is known as the father of anatomy. Now see, Da Vinci, we call the father of anatomy. This man was able to do a public dissection, officially. Da Vinci had done 30 di uh, dissections, unofficial. And he had drawn the muscles and everything. This man publicly dissected and showed the interior of the person of the individual so he was the father he is uh, just as Hanuman is not the father of bacteriology Hanuman is not the father of clinical psychotherapy in the same way Vinci was not the father of anatomy he was known as the father of anatomy because he did the first dissection he was the first to count the pulse rate he coined the name duodenum see different names which are we are using even today these names were given by him and the sinuses are also, some of the sinuses are named after his name. So this was the controversy. These are the different Greek uh, this thing, uh, uh, philosophers who contributed to the field of medicine. He is known as the father of philosophy. He distinguished the cerebrum and cerebellum. He noted the difference between sensory and motor now. He described the valves of the sea. Now you can realize that in Greek dynasty, in the Greek civilization, so much advancement had started. They they explained the uh, understood the circulatory system. They understood the chambers of the heart. They started counting the pulse. So this was the phase where so much of advancement had started. The same time in India also, the Siddhas were practicing the counting of the pulse. Now this was going on simultaneously. Here we had the Siddhas who were practicing how to count the pulse, the Nadi Vigna. But at the same time in Europe, it was going on in Greece. The Greeks rejected the supernatural theory of disease and saw disease as a natural process. They believed that <coughs> made up of four elements. Now see how they corresponded. They said that they believed in four elements, which we also believe the Char Tattva, from which our body is made. Or we now we say Panchaput also. Now they believed that the earth it corresponds to the quality of being cold and it is represented in the humor of phlegma. So this is how they correlated the earth, it is cold and the quality is cold and the humor is phlegma. Same way air, the quality is dry and the humor is yellow by. Same way fire, the quality is hot, fire it is hot. And it is correlated to the humor of blood. And water, the quality is moist, of course moist. And the humor is black white. This is how the Greek philosophy, they correlated the elements of nature with the sensations of the patient. The sensation of cold, dry, hot and moist. And with the different humors. And so according to the humors, the medicines were decided. This was their method of practice, that the elements of nature are affecting the human beings. They produce the sensations in that way and those sensations are correlated to the humor which is affected in their body. And so for the humor of blood, these are the medicines for the humor of phlegma, these are the medicines for the black bile, these are the medicines. So this was the practice which developed in Greek which was followed in Ayurveda, which was followed in Siddha also. So this was the basic of the Greek philosophy. Hippocrates, as I told, was such a towering personality that the things which were done after Hippocrates are known as post-Hippocratic. Something which has become very important, we say, like before Christ and after Christ. Nowadays, we say before COVID and after COVID. We had met before COVID and now we are meeting after COVID. So now that has started. So something which plays a very vital role, a very influential role in mankind, 
the uh, the era is considered before and after so before a post hippocrates among outstanding medical center was alexandria museum first university of the world with huge library of 70000 books i see this is the advancement this school replaced the school of athens as world center of learning this school changed medicine from magic to science the greek civilization was succeeded by the roman civilization roman civilization adopted majority of the greek philosophy both being in europe they followed the greek philosophy majority of the things you find common so some of the things i have not mentioned again because some of the concepts were completely common in the roman philosophy only the only advancement of the roman philosophy was that they identified even the greeks identified hygiene sanitation but the romans implemented it the greeks also had identified but they had not implemented the romans were the first to give the systems of sanitization the systems which we have the gutter lines and everything or the ha rain water harvesting the civilization which came the roman civilization the constructions of their cities were made in such a way that all these sanitizations were possible it was maintained so you can hold hands you don't leave your hands those two girls <laughs> they saw me and they are leaving their hands you can hold it i don't mind it <laughs> so romans had great faith in magic and were believers of god again as i said the greeks and the romans and we indians we have many god and goddesses for different things jupiter was the god of rain thunder our indra bhagwan we also say that rain and it is from indra so isis was god of goddess of universe mars god of war apollo the punisher uh, venus the goddess of beauty which is very few, uh, famous many beauty products are named as venus also so these were the different gods and goddesses there were many 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 which were and uh, they the sculptures if you see of all these god and goddesses the gods are the handsomest and the goddesses are the most beautiful and then there are some ugly goddesses also who are the goddesses of some evil things so there are ugly also but mostly um we if we see a handsome person with then we may say that he has got a physique like a greek god so that is still we use that so they are very, very handsome people and roman had received the medicine knowledge from the greek but they had better and keen sense of sanitization they developed baths sewers that is the gutter line and uh, adequate hospitals good roads and poor pure water for the cities now see this was the advancement which now we have so this they did centuries back this is and uh, this is what is that the underground sanitation was the contribution of the roman culture to the world that what we have the underground now we have but that was the contribution of the roman culture to the world that they gave this ideas that how the impure water or dirty water can be taken away from the city or the dirt of the city can be taken by underground pipelines and not only that they had places public places where huge public places one is such as the colosseum which is in rome till today also colosseum where they used to have public fights between the bull and the man or between two men only they had those for play and it is a big now it is in ruins not complete ruins but it is a archaeological wonder and there they had that underground sanitation you can still, still see there if you go there that still they have you can see that how big pipes they had used made up of stone at that time and how the connectivity was there that the a water and impurities used to go out of the city so this was the uh, the contribution of the romans to the culture of the entire world about sanitation so they followed in medicine they followed the greeks and they were the ones who struck the temples and instead of temples they started building proper hospital the sense of sanitization was so good that they built up the baths for sanitization and for giving the cleanliness and they started having good roads and hospitals all this celsus 
Now see, this was a man who has contributed so much. But he was not a scientist, not a philosopher, not a doctor. He was a rich merchant. That, that is something which is very unique about this man. He was a merchant, a very rich person, a rich businessman. But he was such a keen and ardent, uh, he had that ardent sense of studying the things. And therefore, he has written many things in the Roman civilization. He was one of the most eminent Roman writings. He wrote the De Articis, his encyclopedia of knowledge, which included law, philosophy, military, agriculture, rhetoric, and medicine. See, everything he had written, so many things. Just as I told about Vinci, that he had made drawings of everything. Same way, this man, just being a businessman, he wrote volumes of De Medicina in 30 AD, which was the first comprehensive medical text. See, I told you that previously it was written on the tablets, coniferous writing. Now, here the medical text came. He classified diseases by treatment and not by cause. This was a very new concept that by treatment he had classification. Now, see, again, if you read the commentary of Organa, this concept is given that Hahnemann did not accept the previous classification. The first classification was done by Felix Plater. And the name of Aulus is also there. That he did not accept because the individuality of the person was not maintained. And so he did the clinical classification of disease. So this man also classified diseases. But he classified by the treatment and not by the cause. He advocated the use of drugs, especially surgery and importance of diet. Yeah, D. Medicina contained care of wounds. Just imagine, he was a merchant, arresting bleeding by pressure, compression and suturing or closure of vessel. How to suture the vessels he had described, bringing the two edges, suturing of wounds by bringing the edges together, management of fracture by immobilization, by splints, and bandages of wax, floor, paste, stiffening. Floor means atta. So how to stiffen a broken bone. But now we do plasters. So this is the initial by wax, by using floor, using splints and bandages to immobilize the fractured bones. So see, this was so ahead. And that too by a person who had not, nothing to do with medicine. For compound fractures, excision of the protruding bone segment, plastic surgery of nose, lips and ears, he had described it. Plastic surgery for restoration of prepuce in cases of circumcision, prepuce of the penis, described surgical removal of stone from the bladder and trepanning new for, new for that era. Trepanning was there in the primitive age. So here again he described trepanning also. For certain conditions like epilepsy, as I told, for fever. So they were using this method of trepanning. He derived surgical instruments like scalpels, forceps, hooks, probes, bone forceps. Now see, this was so much. He was not only constricted to one field. He, was made, he described how to make the instruments. He made the instruments. So just like Vinci, he was having a mind which was... Uh, engineering mind also, a literature also, a doctor also. So he had he was a combination of many skills. He also explained the four humors, which we previously saw the four humors, which were explained. And uh, he explained the science of inflammation, which is the most, again, a very big contribution, the science of inflammation. Ruber that is redness, calor that is heat, dollar that is pain, and tumor that is swelling. We still we diagnose inflammation, all ITs, ITIs, is, all ITs are diagnosed by these four features, four manifestations. So he was the first to explain it. 100 years after census came Sorenus, the woman doctor. Now see, this was a person who was a doctor of gynecology and especially obstetrics. 
the different uh, positions of the fetus not only that how to correct the position of the fetus he explained it his magnum opus means his chief work was a standard textbook for 15 centuries he described the female genital organs he wrote on menstruation amenorrhea conception contracts contraception breastfeeding infertility abnormal fetal position and manual methods to correct them that is very important which is still followed protection of perineum during labor that is episiotomy use of hooks and forceps deliver uh, forceps delivery care of neonates and we on bleeding dentitional problem various pediatric areas so you see so much contribution gynec obstetrics and pediatric done by one person so he was known as the doctor of gynecology and obstetrics in the history of greek as i said acilipedus is too much related to homeopathy his writings are very much related to homeopathy he was known as the prince of physician he was also known as hippocrates of chronic diseases he was one to describe <coughs> chronic diseases and therefore i say that many of his writings and teachings are found in homeopathy what is this cito tito what is that you must have heard all oriental teachers what is it which aphorism which aphorism is this is motto this is aphorism 2 ideal cure restoration of disease removal and annihilation of the disease in its whole extent so this was explained by this man so therefore i say that many of his concepts we find in homeopathy because he was the one of who talked about acute and chronic disease he was the one who talked about annihilation of the disease disease in its whole extent or restoration of health he described the marsh ague the intermittent fevers which are described by dr hanuman where he has described the marsh ague the fever which comes with rigor that is ague marsh means which comes in marshy places damp places so marsh ague accurately especially the periodicity the intermittent uh, intermittency which is described in ordinon also he dis uh, distinguished between acute and chronic disease our classification of disease he used the music therapy for the insane now see this was very ahead now we are using it for the insane people especially in ahmedabad we have got centers for the cancer patients that how they are benefited by the music therapy dr shankaran has started uh, relating the ragas with our uh, medicines also so now this concept has come way back he had used this for the insane you know, those who were affected mentally most significant contribution was establishing the practice of tracheostomy so he was the one who started this he coined the term tracheostomy for men mental illnesses this was the term which was coined by him so this was the contribution of this great man Dioscorides was a surgeon and known as the father of materia medica see these were the important uh, eminent personalities who brought changes in the field of medicine so these were his, their contributions then galen now after hippocrates the big name which came to the field of medicine was galen he was a towering dominating personality <coughs> who ruled the med medical field for almost 1400 years his concepts were followed and believed by people for almost 1400 years so he was a very big personality he was very adamant very egoistic and he never entertained anyone contradicting him so he had many contribution but at the same time he never accepted any corrections or contradiction in organon also we talk about galen for antipathy contraria contrarius quaventer 
that was his principle. So we also have got in on in on. He was a towering personality in the history of medicine like Hippocrates. He was the royal physician for three successive emperors. Just imagine, emperors, the kings. He was for three successive emperors. He was the royal physician. He prominent, he predominated for 1500 years more by his adamant outlook. He was so, he was like a dictator. What he said was correct. And so people blindly followed him for so many years. He was a medical dictator. Galen wrote 22 volumes of Edito Princeps. His books, he has written, he has contributed a big thing in a big way. Galen nurtured the modern idea that disease is due to three factors. See, a very important contribution. Predisposing, exciting and environmental. Again, what we also believe in our genome, that there is a predisposing factor. It can be in the form of miasms. And there is an exciting and the environmental. The man is affected by all these factors. So this was there. But as I said that whenever he was challenged, like Servetus did the pulmonary circulation and when he said that Galen is not correct and uh, he gave the pulmonary circulation, then he was burnt alive. Same way as I said that Andres was the father of modern anatomy, but he had to suffer a lot. He was removed from the town of uh, Fedu. Previously, we mentioned Harvey who discovered the circulatory system. He was also punished. And, uh, Julius Caesar was the king of Roman. He was the Roman emperor who was the most famous. And he was the one who said, because at that time there were wars, the Romans were dying and the barbarians were increasing. They were uh, attacked by the Germanic tribes. And so he said that when the women are dying, before their last breath, the baby must be removed from the womb. And so the name Caesarian section came after Julius Caesar. He was an emperor, a very strong, very powerful emperor of Rome. And after this defeat, only Roman Empire failed. The Chinese medicines, now see I have got less time, so I have to hurry up. So this is the Chinese medicine, the dietary therapy, herbal therapy, acupuncture and bad-footed doctors. Acu acupuncture is the contribution of uh, Chinese culture to the world. And barefooted means they were not wearing shoes so that the acupuncture points are in your uh, feet, in the feet and so they can be pressed. So they were not wearing these uh, shoes. Breathing exercise, that is the movement of Tai Chi and Q Gong. Tai Chi, Chi is the life force, vital force. And Tai means continuous movement of that life force. So you keep on exercising in such a way that the entire body moves and so your life force is activated and gong, Q gong is activating of the blood. So only a part which is affected, like you move your hands, you exercise your hands and leave and it improve, improves the circulation of blood. So that was the concept. These were the religions, we are not bothered with the religions, but the basic principle was that there are two cosmic forces, the yin and the yang. In yang, that is Shiva and Shakti, what we say in our Indian culture. In is the feminine or the passive. It is a positive or a feminine force, the two cosmic forces. And yang is the male element, the active element and the male element, like what we said, Shakti and Shiva. And the balance of these two opposing forces itself, they are opposite. One is feminine, one is masculine. But if only they are balanced, then it is hell. This was their belief. And they related with the different elements of nature, the different organs. See, same concept is coming. The elements of nature, like wood is for spring, fire, for river, earth, for heart. So same concept. And they also had these methods of examination, same as we have today, observation, hearing, inquiring, and palpation. So what we are practicing right now, they had the same concept. And these are some of, see, most of their emperors were doctors. So I'll not describe each one of them because Madam told me that I've got less time. So most of their emperors were doctors. Among them, this man Chao, he was of the Chao dynasty, the Chao, many of the pronunciations I don't know properly, 
so he was something which was very fantastic he said that he could look into a person he could see the spleen the liver and the heart and everything functioning and from that he made the diagnosis and it is said that he transplanted heart also he removed the heart of a pig and put in a man or removed the heart of a man and put in man so this is what is mentioned about but there are contributions of imaginary anatomy physiology these were the contributors the important contribution of uh, chinese method was acupuncture there are 365 points in our body which are used for acupressure and acupuncture that was their concept different types of needles different lengths shape size and uh, made up of gold silver iron uh, bronze copper steel many types of needles are made which are used moksha means application of fire moksha fire so they apply for a moksha especially the burnt leaves on the epigastrium to solve many of the digestive problems they apply the moksha means that coal the coal which is hot or burnt leaves on the acupressure and acupuncture points and of course massage which is one of the concept of our culture that is siddha so that was the basic methods of treatment these were the important dynasties of the as we said that in all cultures they divided into different dynasties so different dynasties this is the ming dynasty so there were different groups who were practicing in different ways and among them this man who was a very famous surgeon and he was in the uh, minister he was one of the minister of the king and he introduced that wine can have anesthetic effect the vapors of wine but uh, and he was he made many progress in surgery in china but he was uh, killed by the king himself because once he came he remained absent in the court without informing the king so the surgical development of china stopped so that is dictators they are still the dictators so that is uh, dictatorship now the egyptian culture a very important culture they contributed and their culture was adopted and we it became useful because they had that habit of cave painting and mummification because of the mummies many diseases which they had suffered could be identified because of the mummies the treatment which was taken the surgical treatments also which were done on those people because of the mummies we were able to understand and we were able to understand how they practiced so egyptian culture was again a rich culture and it was transported to the another century because of these two important methods of cave painting and mummification it is an oldest civilization and uh, for picture writing and they were writing on papyrus see papyrus was an early form of paper they were leaves they were known as papyrus and these papyrus were sometimes used for secret writings it was used by galileo also because the property of papyrus was that if you put it in water it will dissolve without any traces so it was a type of leaf which was used for secret writing and when when the church was against them and there were chances of being punished some of these illuminates wrote on papyrus so if at all they were caught they can dissolve that papyrus so the egyptians were using papyrus and they mummified as i told you and so it became very easy to get knowledge of diseases like polio smallpox so this was the contribution of the egyptian culture uh, they believed in the religion so these are some of the yeah they diagnosed 200 diseases practiced dentistry performed surgery made medicines from plant extract there was a belief to install this now same as i said esculapus imhotep was one of their uh, god which can remove the evil so they were putting the statue of him in all the houses um from inches time which gives rise to you, you can also read and pulse was the speech of the heart see nadi vignan again our ayurvedic concept and siddha concept that from the pulse you can diagnose the disease there are some practitioners who are still doing in tamil nadu 
we have got few in Gujarat also. And recently, I had uh, heard about it from an IAM pro professor. He had done a research study on Nadi Vijnan. And so many diseases can be identified by this uh, by this pulse. Not only that, in his research study, he said that uh, usually they give you not to eat uh, like curd. You don't eat curd or you don't eat imli. So by this, they can tell you that you have not obeyed him. If you have eaten imli or curd on the previous or even in the lunch, they can tell you. And that was an IM Ahmedabad professor giving his research study, his self-experience, which I know. So that uh, Vijnan is so, this science is so, uh, this thing is so effective, but people don't know it. And unfortunately, people are not teaching it to their next generation. This is the most, the, the people who know Nadi Vijnan, they are not teaching it to the next generation. So in Tamil Nadu still it is going on, but rest of the places it is dying. But it is so accurate. So these were the sense of same concept that the different gods, as well as the healthy living, the balanced diet, the famous manuscripts which were written. You will be giving the PPT to, to the participants, no? Okay, so they can. Then the Indian system of medicine, of course, Ayurveda and Siddha, as I tell, told Siddha is practiced in uh, uh, Tamil. And it was like the, uh, the main uh, concept came from Agastya Rishi, the Siddha concept. Agastya Rishi, you must have heard, he was the man, he was the Rishi who gave the arrow to Lord Ram to kill Ravan. And he, it was, he was a very Siddha Purush, he could uh, do many magics also and he could cure many diseases. So, uh, Siddha came from him. And Ayutu means life, way to know or to attain. Ayurvedic means knowledge of life or knowledge by which life can be prolonged. And it is from the Vedic times, it is of the sages and seers, the Sant, the Sant Lok, the Siddha Purush. And uh, it is believed that the Hindu god Dharvatri, there was a Samur, Samudra Manthan between the god and the uh, demons. And in that, that god of Ayurveda, that is the Dhrantri came, the Amrit also came, and the Halahal, which was taken by Bhagavan Shiv, that also came. So this is uh, the concept of Ayurveda. This, uh, see, the Ayurveda was promoted very strongly by the Buddhist king. At that time, Ayurveda flourished a lot. But after the invasion of the Mughals to India, Ayurveda died. So it, it had a setback. It did not die now. It is very prominent. But it had a setback. And the famous people of Ayurveda was Atreya Rushi, Charak Rushi and Shushur. Charak was, he wrote the Charak Sahita, just like our organ of medicine. And Shushrut was considered to be the surgeon. He wrote the Shushrut Sahita. And uh, he was uh, fam very famous for plastic surgery. In his era, he had done 16 plastic surgeries, Shushrut. So he was the surgeon and uh, Charak was, uh, and Atre Rushi wrote the Artha Veda. The four Vedas, among them one is written by Atre Rushi. He was uh, from Takshashila. He wrote the Purnavasu Atra, uh, Purnavasu was the disciple of Atre Rushi. And Purnavasu again had many other disciples like Parashar. So they again spread it, uh, Ayurveda. And many of the Vatis are in the name of Purna Vasu Vati, then uh, Parashar Vati. So some of the medicines are named after these Rushis. But Atre was the founder and his uh, disciple was Purna Vasu. Purna Vasu had other disciples also who became very famous. And uh, Charak, he compiled the Charak Sahita where 500 drugs are mentioned. But he was the first to give the concept of di digestion and uh, the three doshas. See, here I with have three doshas or three humors. The bile, like uh, 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 vat, pit and cuff. Vat, pit and cuff. So these are the th three things. Shushrut, he was the father of Indian surgery. And he wrote the Sushrut Sahita where he has mentioned everything, pathology, anatomy, ophthalmology. As I told you, he did the cataract surgery, tumors removing, setting of fracture. He was the father of plastic surgery. He did 16 plastic surgeries. 
but during, uh, during the Buddhist reign, the Indians already suffered a setback. See, Buddhists were believing in Anissa. So, Shushrut uh, uh, theories and concepts did not go ahead because they were believing in Ahimsa, the three doshas, Vat, Pit, and Kal. They also have a Prit Chikitsa that is Contraria, Contraria, Muscurenta, and Tadarth Chikitsa that is Log Similia. They also follow it. This we have already completed. When, as I said, that when the Mughals came, I've talked, I've written about the National Council of India. Just as we have NCH, they have got NCIM. Sita, uh, they live in Tamil Nadu. And as I said, the Saint Agastya was the founder of Siddha. Again, the humors are described over here also. And they had written their... Uh, they are uh, scriptures on the kajjan leaves. Kajjan leaves are the coconut leaves. So beginning they were writing on the kajjan leaves. Later on it developed. Right now it is one of the branch of Ayush. The name Ayush, S is for Siddha. So if, along with homeopathy, the Ayush ministry is looking after the Siddhas also. And they also believed in Vat, Pit and Kalp. And they also believe in Shiva and Shakti. So see many things and Nadi Vignan as I told, many things are common to both these things. There is a central council for research in Siddha also. The Yunani method as I said that when the Roman and the Greeks fell, the Arabs learned the Roman Greco methods from their medicine from there and they developed separate Yunani methods where they are known as Hakims and they used the Urk, the syrup, the Urk, they call it Urk. So, mostly they are using the syrups or the herb for treating many of the disease. They also use vasmas like say Ayurveda. They use some vasmas also. So, that is Yunani. Again, it has more developed in India. Some of the important Hakims who contributed to Yunani. Same for humors. So you can see that all had the same. Then the pulse, urine, stool and temperature on which the diagnosis is done. So same concept continues and they include herbs, minerals, animals and marine drugs. They are prepared decoctions, syrups and egg As I said, they are calling the herb. Finally, the 20th and the 21st century, the golden ages of medicine with commendable advancement like laser, robotic and remote surgery, ultrasound, imaging, 3D printing, laparoscopy, IPA. Stem cell therapy, cancer immunology, AI, artificial intelligence, the latest one. Uh, learning telemedicine, CAT scanning, tissue engineering, grafting, implants, organ transplants, and many, many more today. This is our present era. So this is uh, the last uh, the phase of the history of medicine. Okay, so thank you so much. You all are happy and always be proud of being teachers because as I told you the story in the beginning, we can influence our students and uh, sometimes when somebody says that I am a CEO, CEO, I earn so much, I am a manager, I earn so much, I am doing so and so, I am a doctor, I am an engineer, you are just a teacher, what do you get, what do you earn? Just tell them that I make you a manager, I make you a CEO. I make you an engineer, I make you a doctor. So thank, you. thank you so much. So much, ma'am. Now I request uh, uh, Dr. Kamlesh Parma, sir, to please uh, give a token of appreciation to Dr. Jina Ma'am, your session was really interesting. I hope you felt that this was really boring, but you made it interesting. Thank you so much. I hope so. Everyone agrees with you. Yes. <laughs>